Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your loving kindness. We ask you to have your way by your spirit and possess this vessel and bring forth that which is in your mind for today. Let your name be glorified. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Today in Course 108, the Kingdom Church, Lesson 9, we want to discuss the necessity of Paul and the Pauline epistles as a basis of understanding Kingdom Church. So important. In Lesson 8 and previous ones, we can deduct two interconnected realities. Reality number one. When church is framed as an organization we join, or a building we go into, or an avenue to wage cultural wars against sinners, an extreme distortion of the divine plan automatically takes place. Those things are the, fruit, uh, the stuff of Christian religion. What's the implication? Religion is dangerous to the extent that it is about learned behavior, which is performed inside specific buildings on certain holy days and holy times. It's about rituals without heart connection, where saints engage in liturgies peculiar to their groups. So this group has its liturgy, Pentecostal, Orthodox, Evangelical, you know, full gospel, different liturgies of different books, and they feel comfortable with them. These are some of the things which drive the denominational-based Christianity, which systematically keeps the church divided and unable to attain perfection. And so you can have 10, 15, 20, 30 churches in a city, and they can barely cooperate, even on the basics, because it's normalized. Division is normalized by denominationalism, which is normalized by religion. The second thing, the second reality, is that this leads to the ABC church model, which is about attendance, building, and cash. It creates religious corporations. Though they may seem successful because maybe numbers growing, number of people coming, churches, branches, in terms of structures, big building. Wealth that comes in, when passed through the fire of Elohim on the last day, as First Corinthians three nine to fifteen says, they will not stand. So, what's the implication? Church consciousness is not sufficient for the divine purpose to be achieved. It is when we receive the expansive revelation that the church is an agency for manifestation of kingdom culture that our minds are renewed to see the bigger picture of what Elohim had in mind. And so we're going to take more insight into the kingdom. Yeshua did not come to establish a religion called Christianity. This is almost taken as given. If you believe that he came to establish Christian religion, you know what? We reduce him to the stature of other human founders of the various religions on earth. Religion has never pleased Elohim. He creates sights and sounds which seem to suggest the divine presence when the hearts may be far removed from him because of systemic disobedience, doing things in disobedience to the world. The epic rebuke of Yeshua against religious leaders in Matthew 23 shows how unacceptable religion is to the Most High. It rankles him in his nostrils. It is putrefying to Elohim. Rather, Yeshua came to do a number of interconnected things. One, he came to demonstrate kingdom life himself. Fear with Holy Spirit. First, Holy Spirit planted him in the womb. Then 33, when he was 30 years, he went to the baptism of John. Holy Spirit filled him without measure, according to John 3, 34. He was led by Holy Spirit in all things he did. The signs, wonders, everything was by Holy Spirit. And he was totally subject to the will or governance or kingdom of the Father. 
He said in John 4, 34, my meat, my food is to do the will of him that sent me to finish his work. John 5, 35, John 6, 38, the same concept. I didn't come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Two, he came to preach, proclaim, and teach the kingdom message. I told you before, from Matthew chapter 4, the law first mentioned, verse 17, verse 23, he preached the kingdom. The parables were parables of the kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount were teachings on kingdom principles and all truth. That's what he did. Three, he paid the price for humans to translate from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Elohim. What you sign in Colossians 1, you know, from verse 12 to 14, he came to pay the price by the blood he shed. So that whoever believes in him will undergo that transition. Number four, ultimately, Yeshua came to ensure that the Ephraim is repopulated with sons of Elohim who have his DNA. From the day Adam fell, it was needful that that fall of Adam, the way he was before he fell, which is as a son of Elohim, look at the genealogy of Yeshua in the book of Luke. You see, it said, everyone, the son of everyone. When he got to Adam, he said, the son of Elohim. That was before he fell. When he fell, you know, the nature of Satan, sin came into him. And so Yeshua was to pay the price for those who believe in him to be like sons of Elohim in the earth dream. And religion covered that. Religion did not bring it out. So at the age of 33 and a half, Yeshua was done with this assignment for which the kingdom invaded the earth dream through his incarnation. That's what happened. Joseph didn't know. Nobody knew. Holy Spirit came and invaded the earth ring and planted Yeshua in the womb of Mary. Heaven invaded the earth. So, that's how his incarnation came to pass. Before he ascended to heaven, Yeshua made sure his disciples understood that they were not sent to create a Christian version of Judaism to replace Judaism, what is called the replacement gospel, he didn't come for that. Rather, through those extensive teachings, he mandated them to continue what he came to do. These four things, to he mandated them to continue, to teach, to demonstrate, and to reach out to bring those outside the kingdom in. We can only deduce that the Jewish mindset severely limited the ability of the 12 disciples, including Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot, creating, you know, that Jewish mindset created an inward perspective. And the limitation of the Jews, or rather of the 12 apostles, to drive the kingdom message was so evident that you can miss it if you wear blinders to study the Bible. But when you study the Bible without the blinders, what do you find? Number one, though Yeshua specifically charged them to go ye until the assignment was completed, the apostles had a come here pattern. He said, go ye, for them it was come here. Come to the upper room. When the upper room was too big to take, come to where we are. And they dwelt in Jerusalem. He said, go ye, keep going, keep going until... You finish this assignment, they dwelt in Jerusalem, ready to die in Jerusalem. Contrary to his express instructions, no wonder the early church gravitated into maintenance mode, leading to strife, even food over food. In the book of Matthew 10, Yeshua told them, when he was giving them the dress rehearsal, into whatever city or town you enter, inquire who is worthy, Abide with that person. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not be worthy, let your peace return to you. Whosoever will not receive you or hear your words when you depart. You are not supposed to stay. Yeah, we will die. We will die here. We will die. No. He said you preach to people. They don't receive it. Depart out of it. Shake your do the dust off your feet. Very like so, you shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. In the day of judgment, than for that city. And it shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, 
But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. That's 22, 23. And when you shall persecute you in this city, take note, flee ye into another. Verse 23, for I saw unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Now what happened? Did they go? Mm -mm. So in Mark 16, 17, I mean, Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized is saved, but he that believeth not, he shall be damned. Go ye, go ye. Acts 1, 8, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to uttermost parts of the earth. Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then the end shall come. But what happened? They dwell there. Even when persecution came, the twelve apostles stayed put. People like Philip ran to Samaria. And through only one man, Samaria was turned upside down. So something was blocking them from doing what he told them to do. In Acts chapter 6, in those days, when the number of disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And then the two have called the multitude of the disciples and said, It is no reason that we should leave the word of Elohim and serve tables. So they were serving tables. Brothers and sisters, take note of that one. They were not going. They said, Come. They dwelt. Two, the charge he gave them was to preach the gospel of the kingdom, which made room for both Jews and Gentiles to. Find their place in the kingdom. As Peter's experience in the matter of conversion of Cornelius showed, as well as a strong backlash he received, culture was a stumbling block. So if you don't say this gospel of the kingdom preaching all the world, what happened in Acts 10? The Elohim had to specifically call Peter, gave him a vision to prepare him. Otherwise, his mind was, mm -mm, I don't go to, I don't eat with. Gentiles, not to talk of going to their home. So it was that. So Elohim had to even intervene. While Peter was still preaching, Holy Ghost came and fell. The Lord broke protocol. They didn't wait for him to finish, make out a call. The people are saved so that it, because there was this struggle going on. Not just in Peter. Read Acts chapter 10. You see that those of them who went because of the were Jews, they were surprised that Gentiles were receiving Holy Spirit. Mindset, culture is strong. So, even Paul the Apostle suffered from Judaizers who believed that a Gentile must be a Jew first before he can be a Christian. He had to take the church, convening the first Jerusalem council in Acts 15 before the matter was resolved. That you don't make a Gentile a Jew before he can become saved. Mindset. And brothers and sisters, the third one is that the assignment was to go and disciple individuals, people, groups, and nations. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of Son, and Holy Ghost, bringing them into communion with the divinity, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, lo, and with you always, even unto the end of the world. So what happened? By their staying together, this thing was not done. Apart from when Peter, I mean, when Philip ran to Samaria, that sphere of the gospel, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the most parts of the earth, they just dwelt in Jerusalem. Apart from that incident, brothers and sisters, number four, to be able to undertake the awesome world changing assignment Yeshua promised, received of the Father, and gave to them the same Holy Spirit through which his ministry was successful. The same, unfortunately, except in specific flashes, the disciples were fairly unwilling to give Holy Spirit the required space of faith and availability to use their vessels to do what was needed to advance the kingdom. And so, men and brethren, when in Acts chapter 1, you know what? When they were gathered together, they were being, what their concern was, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> Culture. To Israel. 
He came for the war. He came as king of the war. And we're more concerned about Israel. He said, hey, you know what? It's not for you to know the time and season when the kingdom will be restored. You know what? You will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then that power will enable you to go from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to other most parts of the earth. Why are we saying this thing? Brothers and sisters, the song is this. Yeshua, who came to the earth rim, that it will be repopulated with sons of Elohim, just as Adam before he fell. You know what? That assignment was in danger of not being done. It was in danger of people being brought into building, eat, drink, share food, all that, receive this gift, that gift, this manifestation. But the whole concept was in danger of being missed. In John chapter 1, he told him in verse 11, he came to his own. His own received him not. That's what John reported. But as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of Elohim, even to them that believe on his name. So believing on him is supposed to translate us to become sons of Elohim, just like him. He is the ultimate son, and he's been poured out, his life poured out, so that through the poured out life, Elohim will get many sons, bring them to glory. It doesn't matter whether they are in the golden village of Kilgore, East Texas, or whether they are in uh, Pakistan, or they are in India, they are in Africa, they are in Russia. Their identity was not going to be their different cultures from which they came out. Their identity was going to be that the blood has brought them near, made them adopted into the family of Elohim, made them accepted in the beloved, and they now are sons of Elohim, who Elohim by his spirit would use to do exactly what he used to Yeshua to do, to now continue the work. So John 3, 16, we're told that for Elohim so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish and have everlasting life. For Elohim sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the cultural roadblocks were at work in the Jews. It limited them. It prevented them from getting what they ought to get. It was this that necessitated Yeshua's need to go outside the twelve, outside those who followed him while he was on earth. He went to the road to Damascus to arrest an enemy of the gospel who participated in the killing of Stephen because they put their clothes, their robe, they took it out, laid it at his feet. He was an accessory to murder of Stephen and he was going to Damascus to go and arrest believers and bring them to Jerusalem for punishment. Brothers and sisters, it is important when you understand the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they concentrated on presentation of the person of Yeshua, his teachings, and supernatural ministry. They came to proclaim the kingdom and to bring as many into the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, it is with the deficiency of the people he left that necessitated them to now go and make an outsider not only bring him into the kingdom but make him the master builder so that paul could write in first corinthians 3 from verse 9 for we are laborers together with elohim you are elohim's husbandry you are elohim's building according to the grace of elohim which is given unto me as a wise master builder paul was not boasting the master plan of the church was committed to his trust According to the grace, is by grace that he who was outside the kingdom was brought near. You know, at times you can despise people because you know some things more than them or you have been longer in the gospel more than them. Please take note. That's why I, I so admire Apostles Ron and Pastor Janda. They recognize that their son, Prophet Jeremiah, there's something special the Lord put in him. And you need to see Apostle Ron and Pastor Janda sit behind and listen and receive the word from their own son. Not minding his age, not minding his their son, but they recognize there's something special the Lord put in him for the body. And they are part of the body. They receive it. And that's why Paul was able to say, look, I have laid the foundation. 
the gospel of the kingdom, the church of Yeshua, the kingdom church, the Lord used Paul to lay the foundation. He said, everybody, take heed how you build. Don't just build anyhow. It's not a jagra jagra thing. You don't do whatever you like. There is a pattern. Such is in the Bible. If you're going to do church, go and be diligent to study the pattern in the Bible and do just that. Otherwise, he said, on the last day, the fire will try the work. Wrong motives will be brought forth. Wrong materials will be brought forth. So don't be with wood, hair, and stubble. Build with gold, silver, and precious stones. Build according to the divine plan. Brothers and sisters, that's why we now need to understand that the things given to Paul essentially can be divided into two. One is the exalted identity of the individual saint who is redeemed by the blood as the first level church. The first level church is the individual. We are told in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17 that he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. The same spirit that came upon Yeshua is the spirit that convicted me of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, and showed me Yeshua's solution. And when I receive him, he seals me into Yeshua. And if I'm open to him, he fills me up in baptismal measure. That's why I said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of Elohim. You are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify Elohim in your body, in your spirit, which are Elohim's. So, Paul now was given a revelation that the believer is not just a mere believer to go to church on a Sunday, on a holy day, going to a building, join an organization. That the individual believer is the church that the Most High is dwelling in. Holy Spirit is dwelling in him. Yeshua wants to be enthroned there and the first level church is the individual. If you don't catch the revelation of the absolute exaltation the Lord has given to the redeemed in the earth we will miss it. So you can't talk of kingdom church without this. And brothers and sisters, and this is based on who we are in Yeshua and who he is in us. Just understand that. In other words, the Pauline epistles are extremely about the exalted place of Yeshua. So if you are arguing about his divinity, go to the Pauline epistles and see what the Lord says. That bears on who he is, those redeemed by the blood, as he is, so are we in the world. That's why we can intermingle with things of Satan's sin and, you know, hatred and animosity, all those things we cannot intermingle because they are works of darkness. When I'm brethren, number two, now the Lord now is him to show the church is the agency of the kingdom in the earth tree, an instrument of breaking down the middle wall of partition between Gentiles and Jews through the church. Both are supposed to now come. The opposing groups of people are now. So you can no longer do church based on race, based on tribe, based on gender, based on age, based on socioeconomic status. No. He came to break that middle wall of that partition and to create the one new man of Elohim. Brothers and sisters, when you have time, read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 18. It is through the, the detailed, systematic revelations granted to Paul that we can understand the kingdom church as mystery of the ages. It is to understand the power of the gospel to save and regenerate mankind, irrespective of race, gender, or ethnicity, into the body of Yeshua, which at the consummation of the age becomes his bride. He will unite with his bride to be all in all when the kingdoms of this world are given over to him as his kingdom. Brothers and sisters, to understand these truths, you know what? They present a different picture from churchianity, from religious-based churching. And that's what the Lord wants to do in this cause. It is when you understand these principles that you can understand why you cannot set aside the governance system the Lord gave for his church and take the religious system. You cannot take, take aside the properties that made the church the church and take humanistic religious models. You cannot do whatever you want 
The master plan of the church is in the Pauline epistles. And that's what we're going to do in this course, to look at what they say and then resolve all those things. When we see who Yeshua is as head of the church in Colossians 1 and 2 and see how we are part of him. And so whatever he could do, the Lord by his spirit can use us to do so that the work of the Lord is fulfilled. And we don't know any man after the flesh. We don't go bothering about people's religion or whatever. All we know is God loves you so much. He's paid the price already for you. And then the Lord uses us to reconcile those appointed to be part of the kingdom. The day the full population of the kingdom is complete, that is the day Yeshua will return. Nobody knows the day. Only Elohim knows. Angels don't know the day. That is why all of us are supposed to be going. I pray you will catch a glimpse of what the Lord is saying in his word. It's exciting. It's life-giving. By way of assignment, number one, the limited ability of the 12 apostles to understand the full scope of the Great Commission and fulfill it necessitated the arrest of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, Paul, to get it done. Please discuss this thesis. Two, what were the two broad objectives of the ministry of Paul? Three, please summarize any other thing you receive from this lesson. You know what? We love you, brothers and sisters, and we pray that you will catch this revelation. Tomorrow, we go in. Wait to hear. I want to say this to you. We told people in our local assembly, everybody listening to this, because this is Elohim expounding what. So we will know how to do church exactly the way he wants. And I told them, even told the teachers, please pay attention. You're going to break it down in church for us throughout the month of July. And I want to say this to you, brothers and sisters, nobody got it together. We haven't got it together. No, I'm student number one here in this system. As we hear, we ask for grace to do. Let us pray. Father in heaven, there is none like you. You are faithful beyond measure. Have your way by your spirit and bring to our understanding fully that which you are saying in the now. Release grace for us to walk in the truth. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.